Okay, I've fallen way behind on these behind the scenes videos, but that's partly because the last few were very simple. They didn't have a whole lot of story behind them, so I didn't think each one deserved its own, you know, video or post. Um, some of these are just tied into the stories you've been hearing already on here. But to start with, cool character designs, Cowboy Bebop, Kekai Sensen, and Noragami. This was one of the six posts that I wrote at the end of October to come out over the course of November. Um, in this like crazy six day writing spurt that I went on. Um, in this case, Cowboy Bebop is one of the shows that I've had like at, on my list of things that have to be talked about on cool character design since the beginning. Like there's, there's a, there's a good handful of them that I've had planned from the start. And, uh, this was one of the main ones. And once I started writing it and, um, like I introed with this sort of part that's about the different schools of thought when it comes to character design, as I was working through that, I thought, I should really talk about this guy's whole career um, because Toshihiro Kawamoto is like one of my favorite character designers and everything he's done has been amazing. And I knew that there would be twofold benefits to this. One, to introduce people to his other work, you know, not just Cowboy Bebop, but to look at everything he's done, including some of his, you know, things that are lesser known, like the Gundam OVAs and stuff, but also to talk about stuff that's more popular than Cowboy Bebop, like Kekai Sensen and Noragami, which would draw more attention because Cowboy Bebop, in spite of how it's regarded as a classic and a lot of people love it, um, doesn't always draw a lot of hits really. So, you know, bringing up some more modern and currently popular shows would help with that and maybe draw attention to Cowboy Bebop and other stuff like that. So. Yeah, it was, it was a twofold benefit. One, that I got to talk about this guy's career, and two, clickbait. Um, you know, which is why the titles of Kekai Sensei and Noragami made it in there, in spite of the fact that it's mostly about Kawaii Bebop and other shows of that guy's career. Um, so then the next one, is there meaning in subverting shonen tropes? This video came together quickly. It was another one of the, the six videos that I wrote in a huge spurt. Um, I don't even remember how it was inspired exactly. I'm sure it was just me reading opinions about Hunter Hunter and One Punch Man and just like, I've got a real bone to pick with like subversion as like a thing that's celebrated where people keep like hyping up shows based on the fact that they're subverting tropes or deconstructing and stuff like that. And to me, it's kind of like throwing under like the genre under the bus to say that like this show is good because it's not like the rest of its genre when those genres are are fine. You know, like sh shonen anime is good. There's lots of great shonen shit um, that's kind of overlooked. And when a show like Hunter Hunter or One Punch Man is just a really good example of some of those tropes that have been appearing forever, you know, I say all this in the video, but. That video, it was a ton of work to edit because Davu, um, I mean, we knew this video was coming for more than a month before it came out. So I had him watch all of Hunter x Hunter. I told him he only had, had to watch half, but he wanted to watch all of it. And he really loved it. Became his second favorite anime after Kill La Kill. Um, but, you know, he watched all of it. And then we also had to extensively, you know, research other shows. I had, ja I, you know... I sent the script to Jack's Blade like way before the video came out, like as soon as I'd written it and had him give me like examples for all the Dragon Ball Z clips we would need because I haven't seen Dragon Ball Z in fucking 15 years, so I wouldn't have been able to do it myself. Um, so yeah, and he got, he got that to me within like a week and a half. Uh, he had a huge list because he knows everything about DBZ. He's watched the show a thousand times. Um, and then I also, once we were editing the video, consulted Best Guy Ever on some of the One Piece stuff because he has like an encyclopedic knowledge of One Piece. Um, everything else was, was either me coming up with examples or Davu having to find it. And like the biggest part of the process that was difficult here was just tracking down all the clips we would need, like finding those exact instances in every fucking show to put in here. Um, it took forever to, to edit. Um, but it came out, you know, it came out great. It came out exactly, you know, made the points and got it all out there. And I think it's a really solid video. So then the next one, Akiyuki Shinbo in the early 2000s. This was just the natural result of Shinbo in the 90s uh, being at all cared about. <laughs> I, like, Because Shinbo in the 90s, as I talked about on these before, um, I started writing last year, uh, as in 2014. and uh, No, 2015, rather. Yeah, 2015, I started writing it. 
and then didn't get around to producing it till like a year later because I had Davu around to make that a lot easier on me. And so, um, you know, once it was completed, once I'd finished writing Shinbo in the 90s, I felt pretty sure I was going to end up talking about Shaft as a whole. And a huge part of what inspired it, like, with Shinbo in the 90s, what it initially inspired that was mostly just a desire to visit Shinbo's old work because he's a well-known and popular director, but not really for his old stuff. And I thought it'd be really interesting to show off all his work on Yu Yu Hakusho, which is, you know, a lot of the best episodes of the show, to show off, um, you know, all these interesting little OVAs he did. But what really inspired the early 2000s one and this whole dissecting Shaft thing that I'm planning to do is that I'm... I'm sick of people saying that Shinbo's dead or people saying that, like, Shinbo doesn't work on shows anymore. Because it, it's it's a two-way street. It's, a, it's obnoxious both ways. There's a lot of people who think that Shinbo does everything at Shaft and don't know about the other directors. And I understand why that frustrates people. But it frustrates me in turn to see people saying that Shinbo is basically a non-entity and that these other directors are doing everything now because so much of Shinbo's style still exists in Shaft and permeates it and um you know the only way to really know who's doing what is to look at what they've done outside of Shinbo's work outside of Shaft you know like if you look at Shin Onuma's work with Silverlink it's like very clear what he brought to his shows and what Shinbo brought to those shows back at Shaft so you know, that's sort of the idea behind the project, is that I could go through his whole career and really flesh it out, but um, in order to get to the Shaft part, I had to bridge that gap between the 90s and Shaft, which is only four years, but it was four years that I had a lot of interesting stuff to say about, so I'm really happy with how that video came out. I like it more than the Shinbo in the 90s videos, just because even though it covers less ground, it's got more of a storytelling aspect to it. I really like that I was able to bring out this idea of, like, why do people want to work with Shinbo? Why does he keep, uh, you know, going to these different studios? Like, what's going on with that? As opposed to just looking at his stylistic side, it's more about him as a, as a person. And I really enjoyed getting to do that. Um, it, it was a fairly painless editing process. There wasn't nearly as much that uh, Davu had to watch for this. He's already seen uh, Nanoha and stuff. It, that's another thing about what's great about um, working with the Davu and why he's been marathoning so much anime is that it, it keeps paying off later when we later need to use examples from a show and he's now you know already seen it. Um, so that's helpful. And we got through this one pretty easily. And then finally... So that video had to be done before Davu went home uh, for Christmas. He went home for five days between the 15th and 20th. And while he was gone, I was working on other stuff. And then finally, uh, like at the uh, towards the end of his absence, I was thinking, you know, I might start going through some current shows or like looking at shows that aired this year and just looking for ideas because I'm kind of over the whole write a review of a show. I'd more rather talk about like interesting aspects of shows, you know, just like like find something to say about it that might be interesting and just extrapolate on that. And so I started I started watching stuff for Finish or Fail, and I started watching Amanchu, which, as you may know, if you watch Finish or Fail, I just kind of, like, showed myself sleeping because it's boring as hell. But within, like, two minutes of starting up episode two, I had the whole idea for hiding anime sex appeal in plain sight. And when I, at first... At first, it was going to be more about shot compositions, and this might still become a video, about how the show conveys like pleasantness and likability just through shot composition because the first couple minutes of the episode are just like the girl getting ready for school but it shows her from all these very pretty angles and all these very like wistful fantastical shots and i was thinking about how it was kind of characterizing her just through that um but then I was also paying attention to, like, specifically her design and the clothes and how the clothes are so clingy and how the show really, like, is, to me, blatantly fan y Like, it's taking all these beautiful girls and putting them in super tight clothes and, like, putting that in your face and being like, here you go. Um, and yet, because they're not naked and because their tits aren't in the camera and because... You know, it doesn't have that sort of sleazy edge to it. People don't seem to recognize it or care, even though it's it's not that different. You know, it's still, they're still making it to please the audience. It is still servicing the fans, which is fan service, you know. Um, 
And I thought it would be interesting to sort of break that down and see how almost hypocritical it is that people don't criticize this even though they criticize, you know, even the slightest bit of nudity, no matter how tasteful or appropriate it would be in another show. Um, so yeah, I jammed that script out like immediately after getting the idea. And as soon as Devu got home, I handed it off to him. He watched uh, half of Flying Witch and Amanju and put the video together. And it's really solid. Um, so yeah, I'm glad I got to have a, a title and thumbnail that you know, drew a lot of attention to it, even though the shows I'm talking about were not, like, that popular that I'd expect it to be a big deal. So, um, always a good time when that gets to happen. And those are the videos that I put out in the last month and some change that I didn't make one of these about. Uh, big commentary gonna come soon. It'll probably come out, like, right at the start of the new year because I haven't had time to actually edit it yet. Uh, and then also expect a post of everything I made in the last couple months. It, you'll probably have already been charged for it by the time you get around to watching this. So, see ya next year!